Edvison is probably the obvious choice. Uh, but what other players are there that fans could expect to see this upcoming season? He likes the guys with the mega high compete level, a high skill level, and guys that can skate. Does Steve Eisman surprise us again, or is it time for him to bring in a high scoring center? What could be generational goal scorer at eighth overall? So if that opportunity presents itself, you know, there's no guarantee they'll pass that up. Uh, I don't know what the hell Steve Eisenman's doing. I really don't. Uh, I, I can't. And we never do. Uh, nobody ever does. Do, do you have anything? That would help me understand what the hell they're looking for with the eighth overall pick. Because uh, from what I've seen, this is a guy that isn't going to be called up for at least two, maybe three years, depending on his progress. Uh, this is a player that's not going to impact this team anytime soon, just like we saw with Mo Sider uh, all those years ago. What's the game plan? What's the strategy with this pick, guys? Well, the first thing that I think everybody has to take into account is that positionality doesn't matter for the exact reasons you just said in the sense that whatever this roster is now, by the time this player comes in, the roster is going to look completely different. So I know we hyper-focus on the lack of centers, um, but that might come into play here. That might not. There is a lot of centers that are in range, so there's a good chance that they take one. But what it comes down to is trends. And over the last three years of Eisman's tenure, he's definitely got a type of player. He likes the guys with the mega high compete level, a high skill level, and guys that can skate. So there's a lot of players in this draft and in that range that check those three boxes, uh, regardless of whether they're a center, wing, or defenseman. That's what I think primarily Iserman will be looking for, just based on his own history in drafting. All right. Uh, one question I need to pivot to before uh, we continue with the draft is you mentioned the need for a center. Uh, I still think they need also a defenseman and a veteran goalie. Uh, walk us through free agency. What are some of the moves you guys recommend or you could see Steve Eiserman, uh going in a direction uh, for this hockey team? Yeah, it's it's interesting because there are two different uh, paths really that Eiserman can take here. He can choose to say, you know, this team's not ready yet. This team is not going to compete for the playoffs, and I am not going to go out and spend a ton of money on a free agent that isn't going to push us to the playoffs or make us a cup of competitor now. Uh, and then a couple years down the line, they're not worth the money anymore, and then you've just wasted the cap space. So <laughs> he could just sit back, sign some veterans, and then you know let the team kind of sit in that draft lottery range again. But we've seen Eisman say time and time again, and take all of his words with a grain of salt, but we've seen him say time and time again, he wants his team to get better incrementally. So there are moves you can make to improve the team, to surround more Sider and Lucas Raymond with some better support, to give Dylan Larkin and Tyler Bertuzzi a break from carrying this team on their shoulders. Uh, and that could be you know, trying to sign a second line center. Vincent Trocek is a big name on the market. He might command too much money. I think Nazem Kadri is also probably out of range unless he really wants to make a big splash. Uh, you can add veteran but solid defensemen, especially on the left side, someone to play with more Sider. You know, you know, Sider played with Jordan Osterley, who did his best last year and, and by all rights did more than ever should have been asked of him. But the Red Wings need someone better to play with more Sider. So look for uh, a Cole or someone else to bring in on that left side. One thing I was curious about is, even though um, a lot of us don't believe the Wings are a playoff team, that Steve Eisman thinks they are a playoff team. That's why he got rid of Jeff Blaschel. That he didn't want to get, he didn't want to bring his guy in until he thought they were somewhat competitive and ready to win. Do you uh, aspire to that? You think that in his mind, he thinks the Wings are a playoff team that's underachieving? Right now, I would say no, and I think Eisman would agree with that. But I think one thing with the timing of the coach is relevant to the culture of winning in Detroit. I don't think Eisman or many fans expect the Red Wings to make the playoffs this season, but I think this is the season where they have to turn the corner, not get into a playoffs, not make any noise, but show definitive improvement, show that this is the year the Red Wings start their upward trajectory. Obviously, they brought in Derek Lalonde because they're hoping he'll be a better coach. They'll hope they're hoping he's the long-term answer for this team. So, they want him to build this team, mold this team, and take this team to that next level. Whether that takes one, two, or three years, they want him to be the guy to bring the team in the right direction. 
And I think that's where Derek Lalonde falls right into place. This is a guy, first job uh, in the NHL as a head coach. I think it fits the timeline. We've talked about timelines so many times with the Lions, with the Pistons, uh, now with the Red Wings. The Tigers are just falling off the earth, so we're just going to ignore them for now. But Derek Lalonde is a guy that is a player's coach. I mean, a lot of per, a lot of traits that match what Jeff Blaschel was. I, I do think, though, he is uh, much more astute, at least uh, understanding how they're going to play the game. That's going to matter. You look at year two going into Lucas Raymond and Mo Sider in the NHL, you'd expect significant improvement. You have Jakob Verano, who's one of the better goal scorers in the league on goals per game average. The problem is, can he stay healthy to give you a 35-40 goal scoring season? Uh, there are things there with the Red Wings that are positive. Uh, what I would ask you guys is, Sebastian Koss is a few years away, but if you go back and look at Andre Vasilevsky's growth and his development in Tampa Bay. This is about the time where they call him up for four or five games at the end of the year and they let him play. And then next season, Sebastian Casa, in this case Vasilevsky, started 12, 14, 15 games. And then he took the reins over uh, going into the third year. So I still think we're three years away just on Vasilevsky's timeline. What's Casa's timeline to the pros? Well, what we've seen from Sebastian Cosa in his uh, junior season just now in the CHL, uh, they won the championship with the Edmonton Oil Kings, which was great. He had a very, you know, feast or famine playoffs. It was either a shutout or, you know, Edmonton allowed so few shots against that if they lost, he had like an 850 save percentage. So overall, I think he was good. Uh, in the Memorial Cup, it wasn't great for the Oil Kings. They were, uh, you know, fourth and four teams. And what we've seen from Costa is pretty much his draft profile. Insanely talented, a lot of raw athleticism. He has the frame for the modern NHL goaltender, um, but he's just not there yet in terms of his refinement, his positioning, his discipline. And that's okay. That just means a longer timeline. It doesn't mean bust. It doesn't mean he's underwhelming. It just means it's a longer timeline. And I know if you ask Chris Draper or Steve Eisman or anyone involved in scouting Sebastian Cosa, they would have told you that then, and they would tell you the same thing now. So I would give Cosa at least two to three years here before you can seriously consider him as a, uh, a viable option for the Red Wings. It's not even guaranteed he'll come over to the AHL next year. Uh, I think the solution for the Red Wings for the foreseeable future needs to be Alex Nedeljkovic and one other capable NHL goaltender to play minimum 30 games. Well, some of the mock drafts I looked, to, looked at has said that the Wings are going to draft the center tomorrow. Do you concur with that? Or does Steve Eisman surprise us again or is it time for him to bring in a high-scoring center to this uh, ball or this puck club? Well, I think the way the draft board is shaping up, there's a very strong likelihood the Red Wings take a center here. But that's, I think, more to do with just the strength at center in this draft by volume. When you look at the Red Wings pipeline and the current roster, I'd say the only position where they have reasonable depth for the foreseeable future might be left defense um, on the roster and in the system. There's not a lot of wingers. There's not a lot of centers and beyond most cider. There's not a lot of right shot D. So I think all those things should be in play at pick eight. You know, you look at guys like Matt Savoy, who could be there, who something could be a center, Marco Casper, uh, Connor geeky, there will be options at center. So if the Red Wings deem that, yes, this is the best player available and it happens to line up with their greatest position of need, you know, then it's it's a match made in heaven. And it's shaping up that that's a very strong possibility, almost a likely possibility. But when you look at some of the other talent that's there, like a Joachim Kamel or a Jonathan Lekaramaki, who are wingers, but based on talent alone are good bets to be top eight players in this draft and if the Red Wings truly feel that they are the best players available they shouldn't shy away from them just because they're wingers you know you don't get a chance to get uh, what could be generational goal scorer at eighth overall so if that opportunity presents itself uh, you know there's no guarantee they'll pass that up uh, that's super interesting because I think we acknowledged in the beginning of uh, of this discussion that whoever they take at number eight likely won't be in the NHL for two, three years, depending on their development. Who are some of the players this year that we can expect the Wings to call up and give a go that are currently not part of the team? Uh, Edvison is probably the obvious choice, uh, but what other players are there 
that fans could expect to see this upcoming season? Yeah, Simon Edvinson is going to come in on the left side, and I want to caution fans, they're going to expect him to do the exact same thing Moritz Sider did. You know, Edvinson can come in and have a phenomenal season, the best season of his career, and it still might not sniff what Moritz Sider did. Moritz Sider did something that won him a major NHL award. He won the Calder Trophies Rookie of the Year. So it's amazing. Red Wings fans should be excited, but please don't hold that standard to the rest of the prospects. But Edvinson, by all rights, has almost no competition on the left side. So he should have, as long as everything goes well and Eisman doesn't guarantee anything, a good camp and make the roster. And it'll be exciting to see what he can do. Um, on that note, I do hope they bring in some other support on the left side because I think asking Edmondson to play 23 to 26 minutes a night is probably too much for his rookie year. Additionally, they can look into bringing Jonathan Bergeron up uh, on wing from uh, AHL in Grand Rapids. He had himself a pretty fantastic uh, season in Grand Rapids where some might view it as up and down, but the Red Wings asked him to work on a lot of different aspects of his game. And by all rights, it looks like he fulfilled that in terms of his development and maintained extremely high production uh, unseen in Grand Rapids for a rookie in his situation. So he would uh, he would be a prime candidate to come up and break into the Red Wings uh, along the wing. And then a very long shot, I think, you know, Elmer Soderblom, this colossus, 6'7", 250-pound guy who dangles like he's, you know, five foot nine. Uh, he's likely bound for the AHL, but, you know, anything can happen. You might see him in a couple of games in the NHL, or we might even just see him have some fun in the preseason. So those are the names I would look out for Red Wings fans, but ma- mainly it's Edvinson and then probably John Timber. I'm all for it. I'm all for it. I, I do have a question uh, before we let you guys go regarding the team expectations going into the year. Uh, there was a point in the season, I want to say late January, they were 24, 24, and 6. They were roughly eight points out of the final playoff spot behind Boston, but it was actually more than that because Boston had a few games uh, up on them still to play. Where We talked about expectations and having them improve. <coughs> is there a, a win total that showcases improvement this year, or is it strictly player development? Do you want to see Lucas Raymond become a more consistent goal threat? Do you want to see Jakob Verona be healthy? Dylan Larkin showcase another solid season, who, by the way, is up for an extension. What's what's the definition of success for the Red Wings going into Lalonde's first year? I don't want to say win totals don't matter, for this season, I, I will say they matter so far as they can't go backwards. They can't have fewer wins than they had last season. I think we're the biggest uh, indicator of progression and success for this season will be two fronts. First will be the players. We want to see guys like, you know, Lucas Raymond, Philip Zadina, Michael Rasmussen take steps forward. Obviously, I don't know how much bigger steps Mo Sider could take, but that would be great as well. Um, and just... You know, if they lose the exact same number of games, but they get rid of these 9-2 waxings to the Coyotes, if they're not getting absolutely blown out of the water seemingly every other week, that's also a huge indicator of success that they can keep it from going off the rails. So I think if Lalonde is able to come in, implement his systems, have an overall team improvement in terms of, you know, special teams, the defense especially, and then you see progressions from players who have either stagnated or regressed. I know I mentioned Zadine and Rasmussen. You could throw Philip Peronik into that same category. I think that is probably the overall biggest indicator of success uh, for the Red Wings next year. I think that's the thing I want to see, the defense. I mean, you can't be giving up 7, 8, 11 goals. Uh, and that seemed to happen way too often last year. I mean, that's the thing they need to buckle down. If you're going to lose, lose 3-2 to two or something like that. Not eleven. Would they have eleven to nine game and that they lost and nah, you know, Nadelkovic was scoring goals. on himself. I mean, it was it that. was a tough period. <laughs> yeah. I know, but you should never ever do that. It's unacceptable. <laughs> yeah, there was uh, there was definitely a few low lights last year. So if uh, they can if they lose the exact same amount of games but wipe those from their system, I think that's a big step forward in and of itself. All right, well, Ryan and Brad, thank you so much for joining us. Absolute pleasure. I I can't believe we waited this long. Uh, You guys were phenomenal. Thank you so much for joining this morning. Uh, Would love to talk soon after the draft for sure. You guys are streaming tomorrow, so tell everybody at home where they could be watching you tomorrow night. And I'm excited. 
Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Uh, so again, we're the Winged Wheel Podcast. Uh, look for us wherever you find your podcasts on YouTube. Uh, we'll be streaming the first round of the NHL Draft Lottery, so follow along with us, myself, Brad, and our other co-host, Evan, if we can get him off the golf course. And uh, we'll be covering everything to do with the Detroit Red Wings pick, analysis, reactions, giveaways, prizes, and everything. So I uh, hope you enjoyed that. Subscribe to the channel and tune in wherever. And yeah, I agree. It's been too long. Uh, we should have done this earlier, but uh, happy to keep working together. This has been a lot of fun. I appreciate it. Appreciate you guys. Thank you so much. Take care, guys. Go Be good. Take care.